Right? Yeah, uh, the internship, yeah, and the apprenticeship will continue during summer through fall or whatever. Most of the time they hire to work that anyway. So if we start now, the process will be that if they onboard you, it will be like summertime. Yeah, that's what I was looking for. Like, I don't care. I'll spend my time. Yeah. Okay. We'll push for you to get it. How are we doing? Good. Let me get captions. Hi, Ponzo. And then let me open up my file. So we'll do the assignment first. Uh, we'll go through the notes like usual. And then, um, so today is going to be on code uh, analysis, um, a little bit of hardware and software security. Um, we are going to use Kali or any version of Linux. That's Debian actually. I just lost track of my folder for a second. This would be seven. I wonder why that TV is not running. This happens sometimes. Is it is the power on right now? Because sometimes when they clean, they turn it off. Actually, it's on the side maybe. It's one of those things. It's working. What did IT do to my Oh, sorry. I got it. I got it. Thank you. I found the remote. Michael, you have to walk upstairs. Thank you. Yeah, it's scared. <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you for doing that. Um, so today we're going to talk a little bit about hardware and software development uh, security. A lot of it is going to be focused on the software side um, because it's very close to what you would see in the security uh, development cycle. So you're going to hear about SDLC a lot in this particular industry. So to really start, we would start defining um, what is software development life cycle? So basically it includes the phases from the start when you start designing all the way to when you deploy and maintain your software. Um, everybody has some form of application, whether it's in-house or external um, hosted. So what you would see is you would need to make sure that you implement security solutions. And we're gonna talk about the phases and how security comes in. So in development, you normally see what's, you know, started with planning and designing, uh, which is where you get customer requirements. And then you start thinking about building out your project based on what they require. Uh, could be an app, right? It could be some form of, you know, online interface. Uh, so, and then after that, you would go through and your development team will code and test, and then they would deploy. Okay, so the text gives you this, which is the phases. So you will likely hear or be tested on SDLC in multiple security certification, including CYSA. It will ask you about specific phases or the overall SDLC in general. So we know that the first part is to plan. We kind of have to see the cost and whether it's efficient. Then we're going to look at the requirements based on what we need or what the customer need, and then design. So when you implement security solutions, it's very much like this. You plan, 
you look at what you require, you design your security solution, you implement the technical part, right? Sometimes we don't code in this part, and then you test, and then you train, and then you operate. And that's basically very, very much the same to the security right, development life cycle, which is now we talked about software development life cycle. And then at the end, you're going to retire the actual project, right? You would have to see, think about where is your data going to be? Are, are we going to remove the data? Are we going to archive it? Is it going to be around for a while? And we have to go to compliance requirement for this, okay? Because data retention, sometimes that can impose a risk so we want to make sure that if we don't use the data and we no longer need the data, so you have to rank it and making sure that, you know, you have to retire the data that's affiliated with the actual system that or the, the software that you, you're removing. So here it gives you the overall breakdown in each of the definition, but let's go through and answer the question. So the first question, it asks you to explain why software development lifecycle is an important framework for creating and deploying software. Um, this, for the industry, they use it to describe the stages from the beginning, which is planning, to identifying the requirements, and then the, the phases throughout the actual cycle, which is design, code, test, train, and transition, operate and maintenance and retire software. And then we continue again from the beginning, right? Once we retire software, we will build other software or sometime overlapping. So this life cycle is important because it really provides a way for us to look at the amount of work and the workflow in stages throughout the, the development implementation, okay? So if I'm looking at planning, what type of tasks am I looking at, right? The type of resources. So later on in the case where you get into IT management or project management, you will have to overlook the workflow for the user, uh, the developers in your team throughout the actual life of the project. And it could be a software development project. It could be system development project, or it could also be security plan development project. So when we break it down to the phases, we would see that your task is broken into phases, right? In general, these are the common tasks. It doesn't necessarily have to be exactly like this, but in general, for the first part, you have to do what they call a feasibility analysis. This form of analysis allows us to evaluate solutions and costs for planning. Let's say that if you outsource this, you're going to have bids, right? You have to put out the request for proposal and the, the development companies, they're going to come back providing you with potential solutions, how much that solution is going to cost your company. Internally, if you have development project that is inside, you have to assess the feasibility, looking at the timeline, looking at the impact on how that will impact your existing um, software and your people and your resources, right? So overall, it looks at the solution and how that solution will work with the existing technology, along with the cost for the planning, the process, and implementing the process. So we would want to project, and I always recommend company to build in some kind of cushion or buffer in time and resources. So when you you would tend to over budget a little bit, along with over over budget time and other resources like people, uh, because sometimes your scope can creep. That means that it's gonna build out. Uh, it's requiring more than what you actually plan for. So you should have the flexibility and we'll talk about the model. Then in the second part, it's gonna look at the requirement. And in this phase, you are going to ask the customer for their feedback. And you are going to, usually we would do this in some form of interview questionnaires, or sometimes we would just give them, ask them to provide a list of what they need. 
Um, so they would provide you with the input on the functionality. Um, sometimes let's say that, you know, and your customer doesn't have to be outside, right? Uh, your customer could be a department in the company. So let's say that we want to build financial software for the finance department or human resource software for the human resource department. We would refer to the department because they are the one that's interfacing the software. So they would give you what the, the overall functionality that they're looking for, the necessary features, the desired improvements. So if they're using something that's in existence, you wanna take a look at that functionality and the feature that software feature, and then to really think about how you would add additional improvement to that. So ideally, it's important that you rank the requirements based on the critical level. They would tell you that, you know, so I normally ask for what you absolutely need first, right? And I would rank that high. So let's say it's one to five, five is the highest. So that's something that they must have right? That comes in first. Then after that, something that they desire. That means that it's optional. If we have to knock something off, that could go off the list, right? So you would rank them based on the priority of the needs. So once you have that, you would be able to look at what's critical and to be able to achieve success. So after you have the list of requirements, you would take that to the developers or the developing team, and they would think about the design. So they would take a look at, you know, for each of the requirement item, they would start building out things like sub part of the program that could be functions um, or feature that could be graphical user interface and so on. And so in that part, they would design the overall architecture of the software and its functionality. And then they would integrate data on how data can get access. So software is really about retrieving data, accessing data where it's stored. So they have, we have to think about where the data sits and how the data is accessed. But most importantly, they have to look at the business process and their specific model that focus on this first. So let's say that if I'm building a retail software for my customer to do self-checkout at my store, I really have to think about the procedure of that checkout process, right? When they pick up an item, you think about, oh, they scan the product, right? It looks up the database. It's going to retrieve the price. Once it, it does that, it's going to show the price on screen. And so you have to list all the processes to really build out how your application would look or what it would do. And then you also want to take a look at other design consideration, look at comparable products, right? Uh, some company, they buy off the shelf software because it's convenient, but sometimes they would customize it with the company, with, with the development company, or sometimes they would have people in-house that build it, okay? So you, when you look at companies like Salesforce, they specialize in different type of enterprise software from scheduling all the way to uh, HR database and so on. And they also do data analysis for the company. So looking at comparable solution and services that will be useful. I think a lot of the time now we do software as a service through via cloud. Um, so you have option for company to build out your application via cloud as well. And sometimes that is cheaper than redesign your own, right? And then coding takes place in development. So coding requires your developer to build out their program. Um, it also allows you to kind of test and debug the program. Um, so the analyst, the system analyst comes in here. And the security analysts also work with various air part, but a lot of the times through this, the testing, and the development. So uh, once they build out some form of version before they roll it out, they normally put it through security testing um, after they test it for functionality. So when this is before user testing, that's different, right? So in development, this stage is fully just the technical testing. So you do see some security analysis here. We do check for, and we're going to do static code 
um, analysis today and a little bit of automated stuff, but I want to show you that you can you can do that and implement. And then, so if it's lacking or if you see security issues, this is where it goes. So they have to go back and redesign um, some of the feature and then they test again. So once it passed that stage, it's gonna get to here, which is where you do user testing. So this is normally what we see from the user standpoint, that's your beta. So when you beta test, basically you go out and you give it to the user and then they would use it. And you would try to see if your, your program breaks or if it comes across error, if there are issues with it. If it does, you start in design again, right? And then you also revisit the, the requirement. Then if it's successful, then we would transition it through the integration phase, right? Deployment is always a, a, a challenging area. Even if you test and everything is clear, when you deploy, you go live that next day, things could go wrong. Uh, it can't connect to the server or something is wrong. So once we go through and we have it smoothly, you would train, right? Um, normally when I do a project like this, um, before the integration, I, I normally move training up a little bit. So I'm, I, I tackle things a little bit different because I really feel like the software is useful if the user knows how to use it well, um, instead of breaking it and then fix it and then retrain and then, you know, so, and then we would transition. But keep in mind that, you know, some of these go back and forth, okay? It really depends on the complex uh, level of the project. Um, and then we would have maintenance. And on the average life, some company goes for decades. Some companies would only use it for a few years. It really depends on, you know, what that, the objective of the software would be. And then when we dispose, we would remove the product or we would, you know, get rid of it. Sometimes we need to preserve or dispose data. It really depends on how long the data needs to be retained, uh, what kind of data, uh, and so on. So sometimes you have to declassify before you dispose data. That means that we make it publicly available, especially with government agency. Um, and then you leave it on there for a long time. And then after that, then you remove, right? So it really depends on the compliance requirement. Okay. So with that, let's talk about some of the models that you would see. So traditionally, this has been around for a long time. This is how we used to build system and software is that you go through one stage to the next, right? Requirements then design and implement, then test. The challenge with this, like I said before, is if it breaks here, right, you got to repeat the steps. Um, so, and this is, you know, this is a sequential model. It, people still use it. I really don't think it's effective. It's not resource effective. Um, now we use Agile or other model. So, you often see that it is inflexible. Sometimes you get all the way to here and then you find that it's a total fail. So you start all over again. Um, it, it's a waste of time. It's a waste of resource. I think that, you know, this is used sometime in a small scale based project, it's fine, but fixing it might be a problem. So if you design complex systems, sometimes you do see that it's being used, but I think most of the people, they prefer other model now. Okay, so now the, the, the thing is that it doesn't track iterative work. That means that when I repeat a certain step, right, it does not allocate the work or the resource for that step. So when you contract with a company and you're trying to build out security software this way, what happens is when you get here and you if you have to go and redesign, they don't allow you to build them for this, okay? Because you already allocated a certain amount of dollars here. So it's always good to, to overlap some of this when you go, you're moving along, okay? So low response to change. If the customer comes back and say, wait a minute, I forgot this feature. Can you please add it? You have to go back and redesign recode and then retest okay so the newer ones you would see the spiral methodology 
this is a way that we can uh, use something similar to the sequential process that we just talked about, but it does allow you to have some repeated steps in different areas. So you do have the same component, but what you do is you do it. So the first round, you have the requirement, the design, and then you have a proof of concept. So you prototype here. Then you test, right? If that's successful or not, you would still go back and look at the requirements again. Then you update the design. So this is a little bit more flexible in change, right? So you have two areas where you address the requirement and the design, then you have the second build, which is your second prototype. Then you test it again. And then this is, you know, this is where the security comes in step four and step eight, right? And then once that passed, then you deploy, you integrate, and then you maintain and you train and all of that good stuff. Okay, then the Agile model, this is very common. You hear Agile all the time. People certify for Agile from IDLE. So there's a, an organization that does the, the certification for people who implement this. And then there's different level for Agile, right? Most of your um, administrator and uh, manager for development and IT project management, they go through Agile certification. This is something worthwhile to get. It's it gets you, you know, in the higher pay. So, but the important thing about Agile is they care about the human interaction. So you regularly communicate with your customer and your user and you would ask them, oh, hey, I added this, is this okay, right? And they say, okay, it's okay. Now we're gonna add the next step. So you would go back and forth. And what normally is you have multiple teams working at different things. And then together they collaborate to build an entire software. So it is a comprehensive process and it is a collaborative process. Um, this is a preferred way because it allows you to add change to the plan quickly, okay? And so this is what you would see. So you have some development and testing that's happening concurrently in multiple areas. So you have sub team. So for example, I might have like an iOS team that does the Apple development and they also have the sub area that they work on in sub component, like one developer will work on this part and the other developer will work on the UI. And then they would go back to the customer and they would say, how does this look like? And then they would say, okay, good. And then that, and then the Android team and the Windows team, and then they communicate with each other as they add the feature. So you have some overlapping area and this is the preferred way, okay? So there are the 12 principle here. So down the line, if you go for project management or other things, we're gonna offer the certificate here starting summer actually oh, okay. for IT project management. Yeah, um, Mr. Brown, he's a PMP certified. He's gonna teach the courses and I have it run online. So if you're interested in moving into management, they make really good money. I have a friend that does um, uh, anti-fraud uh, software for banks and his salary is about in the 200s. So, you know, he, he is brought into different banks to implement projects for like a year or two and yeah. Yeah, the summer is when we're going to roll the first course. Yeah, so it's going to mostly be online. And then there's a couple of business courses that we share with Crosslist. Um, we're going to try to offer it for the intercession. So you can, it's it's a small certificate, so you can get that. So make sure, you know, you're going to see a lot of these things, right? Daily talking to the developer and the business people and so on. Okay. So some of the terms that you're going to see are backlogs, planning poker, time boxing. So when you go for IDLE certification, you need to know these terms. So let's answer the question first and we'll break down the term. I actually taught IT project management for a while. Um, so I'm kind of familiar with it too. So I might teach some of the courses. So we talked about waterfall. Overall, if you compare the two, they are based on linear approach, but the waterfall is sequential. You can add, you can pull it from the notes and just add the definition there. Um, and then you would proceed to the next phase. You can't complete after each 
you can only proceed after each phase is complete for the waterfall. The spiral, it does use linear development, but you are able to add iterative process in redesign, right? Re, uh, for adding new components to your software and then retest. So you do have that multiple times and each time you would have some form of output, like, you know, different version of the software um, for your prototype. So in which phase of the spiral model does risk analysis comes in? This is your role. It really is in the development area and the testing area. So when I say evaluation stage, that's really for the testing. So this is when you come in. So you talk to the developer team when they go through the testing process, you check out the feature, um, you know, you look at where your data is stored, how it's retrieved, um, how it's accessed, authentication, authorization is always important in software. That's where I normally look first is how is the user authenticated? Where does it go and how does the server communicate? So communication is also very important. So those things, you kind of have to really map out the process. Um, and then, you know, because the attacks usually happens, right, for authentication, for the communication, for the data. So those are the three keys area that I normally look at when I look at software analysis, right? So in risk analysis, we, we work with development and we, we go through the evaluation stage with them, which is for the testing. Um, and then for the agile model, the important key is the, the interaction with the developer and the customer. That's gonna allow you to apply or add new changes. And you have to implement the change management process um, along with, you know, if it impacts the technical side, if it is a system development, you have to think about configuration uh, management as well. And so another model that the book introduced you to is your RAD or your rapid application development. You do see this, this allows you to have more of a quicker, uh, a quicker output, okay? And so for RAD, the main focus that you're gonna see is going to be the business process. Um, I really feel like in all development model, we start with business process to really design, right? You would map the steps from the time that the user used the software, what kind of functionality that is. And then, you know, if you take programming classes, after you write down the process, you would do the pseudocode, and then you would break that down to the subtasks, like your functions and things like that. So RAD really output your prototypes and you would test those prototypes. Um, Sometimes you would have comparable prototypes. So I might have five, right, versions of the same software. And then I would compare them based on, you know, functionality, performance, uh, and so on. So this is when the business and the system analyst comes in, right? Or sometimes that you would be performing that task as well if you're holding those roles. So checking out the prototype. So for me, I'm a very quantitative person. When I analyze these things, what I do is, you know, I look at performance level and then I rank them across. And then I look at security level and I rank them. And then, you know, and then you can drill down to other areas. So um, I would have matrix for each area and then I would compare them. So the ones that have the highest score, right, is going to win. And so, and then I would take that back to development team and I would say this, but it's lacking this. So you just need to add this and then they fix it. And then they retest it and they give it back to me. I check it out again and it goes to the next step. So, you know, um, overall, you have to kind of look at the perspective, not just from the user standpoint, but the overall uh, maintenance from an organizational standpoint, if you deploy it, right? Sometimes we take a risk we would say, oh, we can't add this because it's going to slow down the application. Um, then you would have to look at the risk tolerance. So in risk analysis, your book talk about that. 
for security for software when you go through and analyze that you really have to take a look at the the tolerance level if they're able to accept that right uh, and that really determines what you will do in as far as you know providing the report um and and the solution for the security side okay so we talked about rad um and so here it also you know agile is a, a an area that you would focus on some of the terminology that they would would provide so here's rad and it has five faces like this so process is really a big deal for rad because it's really built out the business process so you would need to look at where your data comes from where it goes to how it's retrieved where it's stored all of that and sometimes for the security side this is where we will we look at encryption and uh, data classification for the development team, okay? So if we need to integrate encryption at the software level, that's, that's where it's gonna be. So it's gonna look like this. So you're gonna have prototype and then you compare it. And for me, I, I just give it score. I really feel like, you know, the qualitative side, Agile is more like that. It's It's really like, oh, do you like this, you know? But for me, I can build that into a survey. Do you like it? Rank it, right? Um, this is why you get a lot of surveys for the apps, right? Rate our apps, right? What do you like? And then when you start the survey, it's like 10 minutes later, you're still rating it. Basically, you're giving them score and what feature. And so they take that and they go back and they redesign, right? That's what you're doing is you're feeding it back to the, the SL, SDLC. Um, and it's a it's a quicker way to get the general public feedback. So other models that you're going to see, and many of my students here fall into this category, unfortunately. Um, this is only good for small scale, right? V model is an extension of waterfall. This is a way that you can do testing and development together. Um, it normally requires uh, more staff. So you you can design you can code as soon as you complete the design, but coding and testing go together basically. So it's called the model. Um, but Big Bang Theory is kind of like code as you go. This is volatile because you might have a lot of uh, area where you lack resources and your project might be a lot longer than you expect. Um, when I manage project, I do not like this. Um, this is usually like, for something that you make for fun. <laughs> so I see a lot of students that they don't lay out their code, right? Like they don't map out like what they're gonna do, what kind of processes they're working with. They just code as they go and then they go back and they redo the pseudo code. Yeah, I mean, it's okay because sometimes that's just because of lack of experience. Um, but I really feel like like if you have a plan, it's like writing a paper. If you outline the paper, you have a more of a thorough thought in what you want to put in different parts of the paper. And that's what programming is. You really need to kind of lay out what you're going to be doing. Otherwise, in the complex area, you're going to find yourself spending a lot of time doing research and then you're going to lose resources and you're not going to make money out of your app. If you're going to spend 100 hours building that app instead of laying it out and do it in 20 hours, lay it out and do it in 20 hours, right? Um, when I used to manage people, that's what I tell them. I was like, where's your plan? Don't have it. Go back and do your plan because I'm not going to approve this, right? So you have to have a planning process. Okay, I sound like the traditional manager, but that's what it is. <laughs> it's money. Um, and so, yeah, resources, money. So for seven, when a developer has no plan and writes code as the requirements are revealed, right? Uh, the model is called the Big Bang model. And we don't, we, we, we can do that for, you know, other areas, but on the enterprise project, you should have a plan. You should have a clear understanding of where your money is gonna go, who's gonna be working on what, right? And the workflow. They have software to build to work for that, right? IT project management, 
project management. So let's talk about DevOps. You are definitely going to see DevOps on many certifications. This is the thing these days, right? Um, DevOps has always been around. I think we touched a little bit on it when we talked about infrastructure, uh, but really this is for development area. And then you have DevSecOps, which we'll talk about next. Okay. So as you're writing that down, let's move to the DevOps. So this is a way that we can combine IT operations and development in one shop, okay? So when you see infrastructure, the overall, it really is IT and development, right? Because development, they normally build web apps and web apps rely on IT because there are servers, there are databases, there are things that we manage in operation because IT is the business, right? If you don't have the checkout counter, uh, the, the computer for people to process transaction, you're done. If you don't have networking, you're done. So everything comes back to IT, even on the development end, so together. So that means that you have to have a tool change. Now, this is different than just a set of tools. These are tools that are used in a specific process, okay? Um, some tools are used collectively. Some tools, we would use them sequentially. So this is what's called the tool chains. And this is how we would be able to use the tools, and you're going to use some of them today, open source, uh, to really code, build, test, and package and release. Um, Sometimes you get the set of tools that you buy from other software developer to really help you with this. Sometimes you make them right? Um, but there are a lot of resources in the industry already. For us in IT and security, we focus a lot on this part in configuration, configuration management, and monitoring your elements. Um, some of this comes back to software, but we handle a lot of this area in security. Now that brings in DevSecOps, which is the security component of DevOps, right? So when you add experience in this area, they're going to come knocking on your door. Okay, They're going to say, hey, we want to recruit you because this is, you know, this is where cloud lives really is DevOps and DevSecOps. You have software as a, a, a service and infrastructure as a service combined. That's data center right there. Okay. So this is going to be the shared responsibility between development and IT operation. Um, it's a way that we can integrate design, development, and operation together. So we have to take a look at the threat and the threat landscape and then the attack surface in these areas. And I feel that it's really important to look at communication. That should be first because this is the, the area where we fall down a lot. Uh, planning, testing. So planning, we really need to address the requirement, the true functionality of that system. Not all the bells and whistles, but I think really the the how it should be working and that should be best performed. Um, and then the testing and giving feedback. This is your report or analysis. Okay. So with this, we have to have some form of continuation. And this is the book label this as continuous integration. That means that as you use and integrate, you deploy, you still have to rely on continuing monitoring, continuing scanning, continuing updates. Therefore, this industry always requires some form of security assessment. This is why the job is always in demand, is that we have to rely on continuing this. Because if you're looking at OWASP's um, recommendation, they really talk about like how we should be proactive. I think I put a link somewhere in the notes for you. In, and, and we really have to test and predict what that would be for, you know, it's a matter of when it's going to happen, right? It is going to happen, so you have to predict it. So to address some of the questions later on, right, we talked about what DevOps is. So the main goal of the security part of DevOps is to integrate security in design, development, and operation to make sure that it is seamless and it is continuous. 
And so with that said, you have to do threat analysis on a regular basis, okay? And so when we look at that, because it is a cycle, you have to think about all the faces that you, in design, we need to have security in mind when we design, right? Um, and so this is an area now that, that development requires, right? When you apply for a programming job, you don't just apply to program, you apply to program, but you have to have security knowledge. And if you don't, they train you, right? So um, development and operation. So all of those things need to have some form of security element. And when you, and even in using the, the software, right? We want to also educate the user on how to use it effectively with security in mind, especially for web app, right? So, you know, like how web apps always ask you, oh, give me permission to access the camera, the microphone, all of that, right? That comes back to design and security, really, right? We built, we actually work to set up the, the CA, the certificate authority to release that type of certificate for permission access on the platform. We'll talk about platform next. So in, and, you know, the manpower that you put into it is, not necessary anymore. Back in the day it was, but now you can have it automated. You can have a system testing another system. You can have a system scanning another system. You can have a software that do that, right? You can have it automatically patching updates as you release the updates, right? You see that with Windows, right? They always constantly update and you can have the OS just set it up or you can schedule it. You can also automate configuration management right? It's going to go through and it's going to look at what's lacking and it's going to notify you. And then we can, we can go and reconfigure or it can just use the software. Remember we talked about how um, SDN can, can be integrated. All of that comes back to automation actually. All right. So, 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 okay. So here, right. I give you a link for the list of attacks okay for certification purposes make sure we look at those and you can take a look they do a really good job now oh was long ago the website was not as great but i think now i rely on it a lot they give you a lot of recommendation they have all the procedures also you know and then you we can refer to this and sans and all of these elements that you can use to integrate solution for security so you don't have to start from scratch everything is already there right so let's talk about error improper hair error handling this is a big area for software this is you know so attacker normally look at the application they're gonna look for the vulnerability how can they go in and capitalize on certain things so they're gonna look at oh how's your error handling and this is when i when i teach programming i always tell them right make sure that we handle the error, make sure that we handle the logical error. Um, so error handling is important. Um, how to be able to go through and trace information. And then there's the referencing. This is when they're using pointer. For those of you who know C++, well, C++, a lot of the time they teach you pointer in C++. Python, we don't really need pointer, right? Um, in some languages, and so a lot of the times they would create a pointer. So pointers are, it's basically one part of the memory pointing to another part. It's kind of like I go to your house to find your friend's house. Okay, so in order to get to your friend's house, I go to your house and I know the address of your house. So I have to get there and then get pointed to the next area. So this is a way that we can quickly access but a lot of time the, the developer would use the no pointer. Basically, it's it's nothing in there yet. It's, there's no address. So it's just a location that they created. I don't know if it's the internet, yeah, so it's a redirection, right? But in, in the system, basically your memory just have a list of addresses, right? And it's dedicating certain addresses for certain things. Um, so some section is for temporary, some section is for permanent. Like when you install application, it goes there, right? So when they build the application, what they do is they say, oh, use this address 
to go to that address to get the data because it's a way for them to save space, right? So what they do is instead of making a, a, a lot storing data permanently, what they do is they put data in one section and then they use an address to point to another address. And that's that's what we do. And it is a quicker way to do things and it also saves space. But that creates problem with dereferencing because when you point, you when you reference, you have to dereference. So that means that because of the dereferencing issue, um, if it's not set and it contains an expected value, error can be generated and this can be used toward the attacker advantage. Yeah, so CNAME is a way that you associate the domain name with, you know, the, the actual A record for the IP. Yeah, it's very much it's like that. Concept. Yeah, it's okay. a similar concept. It's mm -hmm. kind of like I use a, a reference information to look at something else. And after that, you have to dereference it. So once it's used, you're gonna say, oh, remove that, right? Otherwise it exists. And when it exists, it's store information and they can access it. So if it is sensitive, then it becomes a problem. Um, and then you also have insecure objects. So um, if you learn about object-oriented design, you can control access by saying public, private, and default. Basically, private is only accessed by certain class. So, ba so basically, think about like your family. Let's say that you have parent class, which are your parents. They have access to the children. But if you have other parents, they don't have access to the other parents' children. And you can protect it by saying private, right? You can say that this family is private. No other parents can, can see those kids. Um, but when you make it public, if all the other parents can access the other kids, right? So it becomes a problem with how it's using. And also it talks about, uh, yeah, internal objects or, you know, child objects, right? Allowing the attack attacker to access different part of the object. So some of my students, when they don't, they're not experienced with OOP design, they just make everything public. And when I run that program, it works fine. But when you read the code, you're going to see that, oh, everybody's accessing all the, the children objects. So, you know, here there's data, there there's data. So that becomes a problem. You have leakage. So, um, and then there's race condition. Race condition is when um, system, like system processes gets in competition. So let's say that, you know, it's just capitalized. So all your processor, what it does is it's going to try to access things first, right? When it's available and, and in the race condition where everybody race to it and then it's going to lock up certain things. So here the application needs to act on an object and it's sometimes other things are using the object as well, right? Then authentication, insecure. So all of these things. So when you do application analysis, you have to consider these, okay? I'm gonna tell you what, a lot of people are network defender, many in security. A lot of people are, um, you know, ethical hacker, many, okay? Red team, blue team, purple team, you name it. Uh, because it is very attractive. Not a lot of people our application um, security analyst uh, because you have to understand coding and you have to understand you know programming design and you have to understand security combined. Um, I really like this area because it challenged me, right? It challenged me to learn new things because there's always new uh, development um, approach. So I think if you want to, you know, really excel in this industry far and few, just like Linux. If you learn Linux, you 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 are in the 10% compared to the other 90% who knows Windows, right? Um, so I'm going to tell you, if you know this well, you will do well in the industry, okay? Far and few, you're going to see a lot of people in the team. You're going to have a lot of network people, a lot of defender people, a lot of, you know, attacker um, but at the same time, if you do this, you can also do like 
you know, buck bounty. You can do a lot of things. And they pay for buck bounty right now. Some stuff is $50,000. Some stuff is, you know, $10,000. So you can even do that, right? So here, these are the targeted platforms. You got the mobile. You got the embedded system. So my students, they always get confused. Sometimes these are combined, okay? So I'm going to clarify this now. Embedded system could be mobile. Embedded system, the true thing about it is that it is dedicated for a certain function, like your surveillance system, right? Like you have the smart camera system. It is dedicated just for surveillance, but it has a processor, it has RAM, it has storage, it has, you know, electronic components. It is embedded system. And most of the time it runs embedded Linux. Your TV is embedded system, right? Um, it is its job is to display right things on screen. Okay. Now some mobile platforms are embedded, but a lot of time you're gonna see IoT falls here. Okay. But IoT also sometimes fall here. Okay. And then your client server firmware, this is an area that we have a lot of issue with, especially with car plus you. Um, the issue is that when you're using embedded system, you require embedded software and hardware. And, and sometimes through the engineering process, that, that doesn't get fixed. And then it doesn't, you know, so this is why when you bring your new car to your dealership, they patch it, right? They run the updates on your computer now uh, because, you know, your car is connecting to your Bluetooth or it could be connecting to a certain network and so on. All right. So let's touch on the next few questions. I know it's a little longer today, but. So the type of attacks that you would often see with STCPY, right? Is your buffer overflow, store copy. This is a way that they can, um, you guys know what buffer overflow means? What does buffer overflow mean? This is on security class also. What's buffer overflow? Something to do with the server where you are. Uh, what is it? You get too many requests and then it over and then it overflows it. Something it could be a request. What else? Mike knows? No, Mike? No? Buffer overflow. So buffer means what? Temporary storage, right? And in some sense that could be request. So in a lot of the application, especially as object oriented, what they do is it push, the, there's a dedicated section of memory that's stored, right? That what they call a stack. So when you run an application, right? All of the code that they've written, whatever, you know, the container, like your variable, that gets put into a section of the memory. This is where it's gonna immediately access to retrieve your information. But in some, in some cases you're gonna have, and that, that section is limited. Right, the stack grows as big as it can, but there's a limitation. When you have buffer overflow, it exceeds the limit. What happens is it's gonna it overflows into other area of memory, and that becomes a problem because it either makes the application unusable, right? Uh, because it's dedicated. So when you install application, it's gonna tell you, oh, you it's gonna require two hundred and fifty six meg for this, that area is dedicated for specific things that's requiring for the application, the storage, right? So in the case where buffer overflow for the server, as Jose was saying, it might exceed that limit in storage and it makes the server unresponsive because it cannot use storage outside of that limitation. So it becomes unavailable. And so what they can do is they can change things. They can add things to make it reaching the limit for the, the 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 buffer, right? Your system is always gonna buffer and then it the buffer shrink and and and, and grow in size. Yes. Would a solution be similar to having a firewall limiting the number of daily requests per user? Yeah, so um if if it is for the request because you know sometimes it's not the request. I think performance wise it should be able to handle the user request from the server. The the issue is that they are creating container in the code itself. 
that's storing that's allowing storage to grow so fast because um this is a space issue with memory um and sometimes that comes back to the low level too so what they have to do is they have to consider how to be able to change uh things are stored temporarily and then remove them right uh in object oriented design a lot of time you have to go and, and collect your garbage and delete and 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 how to be able to quickly access the objects in a smarter way. So when, when things keep getting pushed onto stack, what's gonna happen is it's gonna leave, it's gonna flow into other area. Um, and some cases where also like they, you know, a lot of the times that comes back to also architecture with the processor too. So um, you can you can reduce the request, but all that does is it's just gonna handle less traffic coming in or less requests for the application itself. Um, if let's say with a few requests and it's already doing that, and it's not about the request, it's about the application that's doing that. It's about the design for the application. So you know, um, a lot of times when I look at code and 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 when they're creating like unnecessary container and objects and things like that, I would tell them. I was like, yeah. What's the best word stand for unnecessary storage containers that will then translate to a lower capacity buffer? Yeah, because ultimately it just take up more room temporarily. So for um, the insecurity issues that you commonly found for the mobile, right? Your mobile platforms could be your smartphones, it could be your tablet, it could be your laptop. Um, but in the, uh, what you see is the lack of security and communication. Whether we're talking about unencrypted traffic, right? Um, or it just uh, quickly connects. It could be the, the protocol that we're using um, it could be like the, you know, the lack of, um, I guess, you know, I was thinking about wireless for the communication. If we're using specific standards that, or, you know, the, the lack of encryption. So communication could be in other area or your, is your traffic broadcasting? Is it in plain text? Stuff like that, right? Scanner can come in and, 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 uh, and detect your traffic and create issues. Authentication and authorization, that's a must. We spent a lot of time talking about that last time. Insufficient encryption sometimes, and this can also relate to your hash and other area too. So this is just like an umbrella. Um, encryption doesn't always mean that it is the best, right? Some form of encryption is weak and, and other form of encryption is strong, but it makes it slow, um, you know, People always talk about cryptocurrency being the best secured things out there, right? Um, and then the technology and blockchain. Blockchain been around for a long time. Uh, you know, it, it was implemented for Bitcoin and then now for a lot of the cryptocurrency. Until the recent attack, you you know, a lot of people were talking about, you know, it was, you know, it is unbeachable or whatever. It can be beached. Uh, but so... You know, when you look at the technology, you always gonna have both sides. You're gonna have, you know, insecurity will never gonna have a hundred percent anything, right? You kind of have to accept, you know, the the positive and the negative risk behind a certain technology, and that's the way it works. And that has to be really understood in the business. Um, and then your code, code quality, and then reverse engineering. Um I tell my programming students, a program that works doesn't always mean that it's quality. Um, if you have iteration and revision in the program, you would think about how you can improve it from a security standpoint is you have to kind of hit these area. And then for the embedded system, what are some of the things that we can do to improve security in embedded system? And to really reduce the vulnerability, you just make sure that you update the hardware, the firmware, and the software. And that sometimes you have to go back to the manufacturer, right? But in the case that if it's not, then you have to implement security solution of appliances that's protecting it. So um, the book gave you an example, and I think I included in the notes that if you have 
let's say a web application that you run. Uh, and for some reason, your team cannot provide updates for that web application. Um, you know that that's a problem, but you need to protect it, right? It, it's being used regularly and we're not able to push updates for it. So what do you do? What would you do? If I have a web application, it's being accessed by the public, right? I, ha I know that there's flaws in it, but I cannot have updates possibly because maybe I don't have money to pay for development or they cannot fix the design. What would you do to make sure that that web application is somewhat secure? Well, you have to, because let's say if your customer, your regular revenue comes from that application, right? And this is the, 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 the issue that we deal with all the time. We have to use a technology that's not secure. How can we make it a little bit better than unsecure, like completely open, available, right? We have to put in some, you know, if you can't put an iron fence with a bunch of protection, you have to put something there, at least a dog, right? <laughs> or a security guard or something. You have to put something. What do you wear a dog find? <laughs> but on, on the web application, what do you do? What's the first thing that should come to your mind when I say secure web application? Mm -hmm. A firewall right? A web application firewall, a web, okay? And on that firewall, what can we do? We can set rules for the services that you use, which is the ports, right? At least protect that level, the in and the outs, right? We can also set rules for specific things. So if it's getting a lot of like the requests on the server for that web application that's anomaly, then it should be able to detect it. So at the least, it needs to have some form of rules control with the firewall, okay? Um, very good. So I, I think you're getting the gif of things now, right? All else but firewall, <laughs> just kidding. All right, so um, we talked about updates. For the firmware, firmware is a little harder. Um, so a lot of times we have to really identify where the flaws are right? And in the past, we talked about what reverse engineering is. So exploitation kits are really good at looking at some of these, okay? I, I know that there are tons out there. I think they keep saying that like, you know, incrementally, we have more every year. I think it's in the hundreds now. Um, before it was like 15 and then, you know, so Metasploit is very popular, Right, but that's not the only kits. There are tons, there are specific kits for different things. And they, they write tools for those kits. So exploitation techniques is gonna allow you to identify flaws. Sometimes we use the tools. Sometimes we have to reverse engineer. And then nowadays, I think by uh, government and, and regulation requirement, uh, the companies that are releasing the, the product if they know of the flaws, if they um, hide the flaws, it becomes a problem, right? That's a legal issue. Um, if they know of the flaws, they have to document it and they have to find ways to fix it um, or improve their product so that way it would reduce the flaws that they have, okay? So that's, you know, I think worldwide, we are really pushing for this to really be supported by a company. They have to be ethically and morally responsible for their products, right? You see that with TikTok right now, that's a big area that they're addressing right now is, did you know that there are two versions of TikTok? The rated PG version is used in China, right? So China, they use TikTok like how we use educational YouTube where, you know, they would use it for educational purposes. And um, I heard on the radio the other day, and then the the other version is get shipped to us and the rest of the world. So that's what you get. Um, so right now they're trying to enforce regulation on these tech companies to make sure that they protect the privacy and the data of, of their, their clients. Okay, so um, we asked, we answered this question earlier, right? For a web application, a uh, firewall should be used to, sorry, to protect the applications that's vulnerable. Um, I meant to say lack of 
notes. So I was tired when I typed that. I should have asked Jack GPT to type stuff up for me, but <laughs> so we would use WAF or web application firewall to protect the application at the least, right? And that will kind of reduce the vulnerability. It won't remove it completely, but it would reduce it. And then um, there is a list on your notes and it talks about different form of attacks and injection. And you can also reference OWASP or OWASP to kind of look at how to protect. So in the case of SQL injection, um, the you have to take a look at the parameter in the queries. And that's what really SQL injection is, is they're trying different queries to be able to obtain some form of output. And um, that is going to be pre-compiled SQL queries that would take specific input. So input validation is important here, especially for an application that uses database, right? Um, I'm sure that there are tons of resources that you can find to address, you know, SQL injection and how to really build more of a secure application that uses, you know, whether you're using SQL or, you know, there are other products like NoSQL, MongoDB, and all of those um, for a specific product. But ultimately, when you're using database, you generating a query, right? Like when I'm submitting my username and password, that's actually stored from a database. So when I submit it, it goes to the database and it looks for the match. Once it finds a match, then I'm authorized, right? Like a certain type of uh, privilege to be able to access the application. So when you're doing banking online, that's basically it, right? You are a record on the, the database of the bank. And, and you when you looking at like different area of that record, like I'm looking at my statement, I'm paying my bill, all of that, right? So um, a lot of the times queries are really designed to quickly look at the database in a certain column and role. Um, so when I'm accessing my account, I'm a record. So it's a role in that database, but I can also query it for a whole column of password, which is what SQL injection does, or username or credit card information and so on. So if, if we are looking at the pre-compile of what is being input before the execution, we can prevent it from having injection. And so that's the whole point. And then next we're gonna talk about API. So what API does for you is it is a way for you to let your application talk to other systems or other application, right? It is the middleman. Uh, we can also add feature in addition to our existing application. API can be used for monitoring. It can also be used for attack. You know, the Nmap has an API um, or Berkeley um, has the integration for API. So this is a way that we can integrate application on top of application. So what we need to do for our system is we need to really take a look at our network layer, which is coming back to what I said before, communication, right? Network layer is really about routing. Um, how that relates to communication and how system sees one another and how that's, the system is used to communicate for the services through the API. So when I'm looking at like authentication with web, so when you're using like OAuth, we talked about OAuth last week, right? You're using OAuth to authenticate to a web web application, which is a website um, that has some interface for you to log in and be able to access some data, right? From database. Then you have to take a look at like the port that it's using to send out that traffic once you're you once you're authenticated and then for your authorization is it coming back with the certificate how is it granting you all this privilege and it's using encryption if it's using https pls and so on so we have to take a look at the type of services that ties back to the communication and that's how we're going to be able to protect our api okay 
And so when you're integrating API and components of development, you're going to see that they're using what's called a framework, right? Uh, you can use API framework such as SOAP and RESTful. I think I talk about SOAP in my 30B and RESTful in my 30C and E. There are other classes that I touch on. At RESTful or REST is as what it's known. It is used for us to be able to integrate API in a specific way. Um, framework is really like the backbone on how we would be able to adapt uh, different elements from different things to the application. So REST and SOAP really allow developers to create their own APIs. But SOAP, un unlike SOAP, REST is not a protocol, right? Uh, it is really defined as a framework. It is an architecture that is designed and built. It's used for design and build. So think of it like a layout, right? Uh, the bone of the building, the, the foundation with all the structure. And then you'll be able to build out based on that. So you can add walls and doors and windows and roof, which is what REST does, okay? So you can make your own API. SOAP is really a protocol, and protocol really relates back to standardized rules that we implement so that way it could do specific things. Okay. So API is located on the bottom of page, uh, what page was that, seven and, and going to eight. And so here is SOA. Make sure we look over service-oriented architecture. That might come up on your certification. This is a way that we design software to give, to provide services, okay, to other systems. So um, we can make it a program to be able to allow services like authentication services, uh, communication services, and so on. And then SOAP, which is Simple Object Access Protocol. This is XML. And it is a way for the system to be used for web services. And so this is why when we pull data, a lot of the time it is in a XML base for most part for the web, but there are other components like database that uses XML as well. Um, so, because of this protocol, it really defines how your message is c communicated, okay? And then how it's processed. So it is an extension or it's extensible um, to what you would see for the application compared to REST, right? It requires you to have a uniform interface. It separates the client and the server. Um, and then there's specific things. So. One important area that I want to point out, public and private APIs exist. And so making sure that we understand the type of technology and framework that we use. Okay. And they are vulnerable. So a lot of the times you have to take a look at what the attack surface is because it ultimately it is a program. Okay. All right. For application testing, the answer for the next one is located here on page nine. So for the next question, it asks you to identify four methods for application testing. You can use a tool to scan. You can use an automated vulnerability scanner. You can do manual pen testing and you're gonna do code review. So we are gonna use a tool to code review today. Okay, and what code review does is it's we compare it to a set of rules, right? So let's say that think of code as an essay or a paper that you have to write. In school, your teacher tells you you have to have an introduction paragraph, a body paragraph, and a conclusion. And programming is like that, right? There's specific rules and syntax and things that we set to write a program. So 
in an automated scanning tool, what it does is it's checking against those rules. It's saying that, oh, is the syntax is correct? Is there a way, is it meeting the criteria for error handling? Is it doing this? And in some cases, a lot of times it's looking at, you know, how the, the line is written. Okay, or many lines are how it, it, it's written in a program. And so when you do manual review, basically you read the code and you see how that is. And we'll talk a little bit about static and some of these tools down the line. And so um, in the text, it gives you some of these. I actually used Crucible in uh, my 30B class before. It's, it's pretty cool. Um, I've also used it in 30C. So you can use Crucible. You can also do static code review, which is what you're gonna do. And I use it specifically for Python. So sometimes they are very oriented to the language that you, you are testing. Um, so C++ have different tools compared to Java and then Python, or sometimes they share the same tool. And then you can also do differential code review. So these, they already created some of the tools for you. And this one's a little longer. And then in the later part, after you have used these tools to do analysis, you would have some form of interpretation of your analysis, right? Analysis is really about gathering the data, right? Understanding the data, and then to be able to interpret it and put it into a report. So um, for the regression in, in, in your text and also your notes, it talks about when you need to really apply your patches and updates, this is when you would perform regression. So we would analyze and look at, you know, our applications or our system um, in the case when we're looking at hardware in the case that if we want to install patches and updates or new updates to our system, then we would perform what's called regression. <clears throat> and then on the hardware security side, a lot of it could also be design. Some of it could also be on the firmware level. Um, so in there lists a bunch of different things, and I recommend that you look through those, kind of have a better understanding of what they are. And as soon as we finish here with the questions, I will flip back to the notes and show you. Um, but in the case where when we're looking at atomic execution for the hardware security, this prevents other processor or other devices. So when we say processor, we meant multi-core processor. So in the case, if you have like 12 core, right? Um, when you, when you in, in concurrent programming or the way that they build fast application these days is we would make a container that would list different processes and we would call those processes together. So what that does is it capitalize on your multi-core. So all your cores can be at work or most of your cores. So if I have 12 core, right, maybe 10 out of my 12 core can handle all my processes together. And you can do it as thread or processes, right? In Python, we can do that. So what happens is they sometimes can be competing, but you would have devices that are accessing the same data location, right? And we talked about container earlier for your data. So let's say that I have one process that modifies the data and then put it back into the container while the other process, and that can create error, right? Um, and then sometimes that they go not in a sequential order, it's all together or they're overlapping. And in this case, we wanna make sure that the, uh, the accurate data is, is, is being produced through the modification process and the operation to make sure that there's integrity in the operation. Um, so, you know, writing a fast program doesn't always mean that it is quality program. Sometimes it is not. So we have to take a look at that, right? And then, um, and then it also talk about how you can secure hardware 
Um, a lot of it has to do with physical security. Hardware really pertains, a big chunk of it is physical security. Theft, loss, damage, right, and tampering. So in the case I have desktop in my facility or my servers, you can also install anti-tampering equipment, right? Um, it could sound off when it's it's touched a certain way or broken a certain way or, you know, uh, things like that. So you can have some kind of alarm system. You can also have some mechanism with the anti-tampering system so that way they can't tamper it, like bolt things down, uh, you know, things like that where they can't physically remove it, lift it up, uh, damage it, and so on. And then in the case when we're looking at drives, right? Uh, as logical tampering, you should encrypt your drive, uh, especially if if it is accessible by other areas or other devices on the network. Um, and then the bus. So when we say the bus, it is a connection path, right, to access your data. A bus could be many things. It could be a line of cable. It could also be a bus on a motherboard. It could also just a, a line to be able to transmit data between storage location and then moving it to other area of the system or the network. So you need to make sure that that transmission is protected. So when we're looking at the network, we have to think about, you know, non plain text transmission. Uh, when we're looking at storage, we got to make sure that permission control is here because this is object, right? And when data is on the move or it's being accessed from a database across the network for your web application. So you have to think about that. But ultimately on the hardware level, um, pay attention to firmware, pay attention to tampering, pay attention to how data is accessed, how data is stored um, and be able to protect that. Okay, are we okay? Any question? Not too bad, right? Two and a half hours in. Your lap is really short today. So, okay. So I gave you a a lot of information here, right? Um, about version control, about coding, about the tools that you can use. Um, there are some additional tools here, so you can have assisted tools. You can have inspection of your code. Um, long ago, we didn't really have this. Or you can do static code analysis, which is what you see in the lab today. And then you can have automated. So buzz, right, is the buzzword these days. You can find a bunch of YouTube tutorial on fuzz. I did do a lab with fuzz with my 30C class before. Uh, there is tool that's Linux-based that's written for Fuzz. So this is a way that you can send invalid data randomly to an application to test it. So I always tell my student to test their app, their program before they submit it for me. And normally they just run it and then they type in input. Like, you know, we want to check for invalid input. So if a program asks a user to enter their name, right? When I test a program, I don't just test it by typing in their name. I just type a bunch of things to see how, what kind of length that it's going to take, what kind of characters it's going to take. Um, is it going to really generate the proper input control, right? So the developer, they actually say that, oh, anything outside of this range of input, you know, loop it back and make them enter it again. So input validation is a thing that we all we teach in school when we start programming, but it's also implemented. But Fuzz allows you to test it to the capability, the maximum capability. So this is really good for input validation. And I love this area, actually, because it's really fun for me. Um, but you can have a script that does this. You can have a tool that automatically generate and it buzz it for you. Um, there are already existing tools. And then uh, we can also test it for fault injection. Okay, we can uh, look at injection during the compile time, during the, the, the protocol software time or the runtime. 
and then mutation testing. So when they say mutation, this is related to bus and fault, but it is a way that the, the program changes based on the input. This is what you see with a lot of AI integrated programs these days. Um, so in a program, usually it branch, right? Like if the user entered this, it's gonna go this way, right? Yes, true here, right? If the user entered this, differently it's going to go the other way so depending on the conditional branch of the program so for mutation the the behavior of the program really depends on the input so what we can look at is we can also apply plus to really think about how it changes the nature of the program and whether there is small or large modifications or there's error and then stress testing and load testing. So a lot of the beginning uh, type of development, you're gonna see some of that. Worst case scenario, that's why I tell my students, performance-wise, you wanna load and stress test based on the worst case scenario, not the medium or the best, right? Worst case scenario. And then regression testing, we touched on that earlier in our question. You can find that on page 13 out of 15. Okay, so changes that are made that doesn't create different issues. So updates should not, right? But we know for sure Windows updates sometimes create other issues. So you question about the regression testing. And then user acceptance testing, your UAT. This is... um done quite a bit for security system development. You have to make sure because, you know, we're notorious for implementing security solutions and then it makes things worse for people, like slow it down. Uh, you know, so people always read this, right? Uh, single sign-on can be a good thing, but multi-factor is required, right? People are like, no, I don't want to use my mobile phone for work to verify who I am. No, I don't want it to do that, right? So you got to, you know, the acceptance level is usually the challenging part for the user's side. So, you know, looking at your business processes, looking at performance and how that impact production. And then this is my favorite, actually. And verb is okay. I also used this before in my class. So I try to use industry parallel tools, I think, you know, but check out those tools. Qualys, you can download the, the free version and then play with it. I recommend it. But I know that this, when we use the kit at the beginning, do you remember when we, when we, we scanned and it was like a bunch of kits that were going? Uh, Qualys is one of them on there. So if you have Linux, there is an open source version of it. Um, or the free version of it. And then for the hardware, it tells you to use encryption firmware, testing, uh, and then how to manage it, okay? Read about secure enclaves. This is for Apple mobile devices. There is specific process in this, right? Because they use kind of different things. So when you need to manage Apple products, Okay, and then the last question is here on this page. Any question? From those tools, which one would you recommend most? Um, burp, I know you mentioned burp. Yeah, we did, we did a little bit of burp. You should go back and register for the account and use their full version. Uh, or at least, you know, because the one that we used was very slimmed down. Like it didn't let you do a lot. Um, unless you register for an account with them. Um, so I recommend that. And I know that there are a lot of really great tutorials on YouTube that's done by professional or people who, you know, and even from Burp themselves, they they have like their little tutorial. Um, this is one of my favorites. It's just because, you know, I sometimes I'm biased to certain tools, mm -hmm. things that work for me that, yeah, Qualys is good. Uh, Acunatix is also good. This Arachne, I actually wrote a lab for you guys with Arachne. Um, and did I integrate it? Maybe I didn't. Uh, 
some challenging with it, I think, especially using VM for it. But uh, yeah, so those are the the ones that NetSparker, they, they also get a lot of traction. So when you look up like the top 10 uh, code analysis tool, you're going to see this one. You're going to see this one. You're going to see this one right? And maybe this one, maybe within the top 10, but the top five, you're going to see those. NetSparker is also one of them. Um, it's just the popularity. So you have to think about the functionality on how it's used. Not to, You're not going to have a one-stop shop, right? A lot of people try to make Burp a one-stop shop, but you know, I really feel like some of their features are still lacking. Um, you have to think about like using tools that are overlapping. Uh, it can do it, yes, but then use a tool that's just best for for certain things. Okay, so just, but this this industry is about the tools you know. So as you use it, you know it. You put it on your list, right? You put it on your resume. Okay, so check those out. I didn't have much time to send put the link for you, but of course you can always ask Google. All right, so let's talk about the lab. So I'm going to stop share on this side. And then I will switch to my computer on that side. And I didn't have time to set up my, my stuff. So I'll do it with you. This should be short. I actually did this exercise in 30C already. And I'm using the same because I want you to know the, a little bit of the programming side for it. And it's not too much, it's very small, but you can use it for a large program as well. Okay, it's great for Python. Oh, uh, mouse, sorry. Professor, I have a quick question. Sure. Where, where exactly is the session token included? For the session, it's when, for our web, for SSL, or TLS. Oh, oh, for, so if you use it for authentication, it's implemented there. It's usually implemented there. It doesn't... Uh, as an example, I did read this session token on your system that bypasses all of his authentication there. So where would I need to get on my system? Well, it's being released. Your access token is being released by your your uh, your authentication server, which is tied to you know. It depends on the technology. If you're using Kerberos, it's actually released from your your CA and your ticket granting system. So. Basically, it is a server with many role, right? So it's tied. So when it when it does that, so he authenticates, right? And and whatever that you set up for his membership as a user, it's gonna go and it's gonna look at that membership and it's gonna check against the policy. What that policy is tied to, you know, the certificate that it has. So for that session, that session is established based on what's granted to him, which is coming from the other server role. So, you know, but ultimately, if you're talking about Windows environment, it's 80. It's 80 with the CA and the TTP. So what application are you sitting here to gain all the, all the accounts while they say? To look at his accounts, um, on the Windows side, I think you can use formerly known as um the Windows Security Monitoring capability, but I would use something like a CM uh, type of software that integrated because a lot of them allows you to set it up with the Active Directory, but a lot of times like. What we do is we audit it back to, you know, but you want a monitoring system. So when he logs in, it actually, when you when you go through, it's it's showing like which system is logging in and which account. And then, you know, and then, you know, on that end, you can also set up, you know, the security feature. If it sees something that's different than your normal baseline, it will notify you. Um, so normally they would use a centralized security system for that. But as far as like AD administration, you do have logs for it. You have to go to event viewer and take a look at the security logs. And then because once it, it sends that access token or, you know, it, it provides that access token, it generates that log. It says so-and-so was given this. But, you know, normally they would run IIS 
tying with, you know, we, we did do a setup for that in one of the other class, um, tying it back to like authentication and authorization and all of that. But, but I would use a monitoring tool. Okay, so we are going to do a static code analysis. So let's see, I'm gonna open downloads. Michael, you okay? Yeah. Okay, no, I'm just, you seem a little worried or something. Okay, so you can use Ubuntu for this. You can also use um, Kali or even other Debian base. Uh, this is written for Linux use. So static analysis is really a way that you look through the code and then you would identify the problem. It's kind of like having the human eye scan through, but we're gonna use an, a program to do that. Uh, and then find the issues in the code. This is very, cheap or feasible compared to dynamic analysis. So the difference between static and dynamic is dynamic is a little bit more costly. So when we say cost, right, it means resource heavy. Um, it means process heavy. So when you when you perform static analysis at it is lighter, um, it is not as flexible, however, in execution, it requires less of your processor resources and your storage resources. So in order to run effective static analysis require some challenges, right? The simplest form of static analysis is to search through the code line by line. So basically it's gonna read it line by line as a string. So, it, it, so your line of code is gonna be parsed through and it's gonna treat it as a string and it's gonna go through the syntax tree. So the program itself, remember I talk about the set of rules. So think of it like, if you ever use Grammarly, it's very similar to that, right? They basically read through you, the, chat, the, the things that you wrote in plain English, and then it fixes the grammar for you. It gives you the recommendation. What, what this does is it reads through each line of your code and it, it looks through the, the syntax tree which has a set of rules set up as conditions. And it's gonna be able to determine if the, the code has problem or not. Okay, so we're gonna use a thing called DLIN. This is specifically for Python, right? Um, this allows you to apply the set of rules and we use what's called a linter. This evaluates the rule against your code. So it still reads it line by line. It's going to check the rule and it's going to look at, and the way that they made it is they use the common best practices for programming and more secure Python. So when you write a program in Python and you want to check to see if it's secure, you can use the static analysis to kind of look through it real quick, okay? And it uses what's called a flake eight. And flake eight, allows you to parse thing from the AST or the syntax tree. Um, so you don't have to really think about like, you know, so you can tell the developer, just write the program how you wanna write it. And we're gonna check it to see if it has security problem by just sending it through this program. And so now the program is only effective if the set of rules that it's used is effective, right? And so here, as you can see, it talks about how it uses this standard um, for best practices. And I wanted to include this because in the notes, it talks about how you can arbitrarily execute code. And so what this does is in attacking the code, what the attacker does is they would send in arbitrary code. That means that they just put in random things and or sometimes not random thing, intentional thing. So that way they can see the behavior of your program. So that way, if they found a bug, they're gonna capitalize on that. That means that that's a flaw, right? And it would use a reverse shell to be able to look at it and add in a malware. So if they found a bug, they say, oh, okay. 
I can probably inject in a subprogram, which is a malware. So that way it can be downloaded with payload and then log some kind of action. So this can be a Trojan or something like that, right? So arbitrary code execution is needs to be effective. We need to test it. So we want to make sure that we don't get attacked through arbitrary code um, and so on. Okay. So I had my uh, Kali extracted, right? You can download the extracted virtual machine or compressed virtual machine folder and then extract it. And then you just boot it and log in. I demoed this in Ubuntu because for programming, I make them use Ubuntu, but some of them use Kali. Um, I use Ubuntu because the programming students, they're not familiar with Kali, even though it's easy, right? But so. But Kali's cool. All right. So what we're going to do is we are going to install um, the module. Okay, so Python, when we say module, is basically this is a tool that's written in Python called dlint. And if you are using a brand new Linux machine, not Kali, you need to make sure you install Python first in order and pip, right? Um, don't assume that pip is there. It usually tells you the error you have to install pip. But pip3... So this is allowing us to install Python-based uh, type of files, okay, like application. So let me move this down and move this up so we can work with it together on one screen. And so what we're going to do is we're going to do a pip3 install dlint. And it's going to go for a few seconds. Now, I recommend that even when you use a virtual machine and if you read the information that's outputting, uh, a lot of these tools you should consider running a Python VM inside your virtual machine, right? If you look that up, it's all over Python documentation. It's all over online. There's tutorial for it. I think I've done a, a couple of lectures that how to be able to enable Python VM because it doesn't impact your overall system files, um, but you can run it directly. So what we're going to do is we are going to use Nano and Nano is used as a text editor. It's kind of like notepad in Windows to write your program, right? So we're going to do nano test1.py, which is a Python file. So basically, we write a program and we put it through the test. Um, if you have a Python program that you wrote, you can also send it through dlint. So here it is. Um, and then what you want is you want to make sure that you have the proper indentation and space. So let me just copy this. Now you notice that when I copy to it, right, it doesn't have the proper indentation. This is going to get an error, right? So you got to make sure that you go up and down. So um, so I'm going to tell you what the code means real quick. Okay, so Python, this is, we're using a library called Pickle, okay? And um, what we're going to do is we're going to use Pickle to kind of access uh, and access what's in the container here. So this is a list of what you would know as array. It has a bunch of strings. So it's mastering Python security. And then we are having a loop. So it says with open data.pickle, right, um, wb as a file. So we are going to make, we're going to open a file and we're going to append, right, each of the, the string here with wb. So basically we would match up and pair the word, word would work, right, wb mastering 
uh, and so on. So we, uh, or I'm sorry, we're making a file called WB and then we're gonna put these on the file, each of the, the string onto that file. And then we're gonna have a uh, use a dump method and to be able to parse all the string onto that file. Now there's other ways that you can do this. You can do a write to file, but this is a quicker way that you can make a Python script that take whatever that you put in that container and put it in a text file. That's basically what I'm doing, okay? So um, it says, make sure that there are white space after the commas before and after the equal sign, right? We wanna make sure that. And then for the indentation, I wanna make sure that it uses four space because it's going to flag it. Oops. Huh? What do you mean a space? Yeah, a space after each comma. Well, I'm talking about the line of code. Line of code? So, as an example, import table on the Word doc. Yeah. There's a, there's a line in between them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. No. no. If you put the line there, because I think it's space sensitive uh, for DLint. So, what? So, DLint is going to look at your code as it should be looked at as another developer looking at your code, right? It's kind of like your English expert reading your paper. It's going to say, oh, put a comma here, period, there. And if you don't put it in the right place, you're wrong, right? right. So um, yeah, you can just copy and paste what's there and just making sure that your indentation is for space from the left for the pickle dot down. Yeah, that is a body of your with open statement. So that's why you have to indent. And Python, you indent for, you know, whatever that's part of that statement. Um, okay, so once we're ready, we're gonna do control X. If I click here, let's move this up and then press yes, and then enter. So I finished step five. And then since um, this program uses Flake 8, I hope that it, it has it. So I haven't tested it on Kali for this one. Yeah, so you would need to install Flake 8. So yes. Okay, if assessment return no error, the program's path, see information. Give me a second. Let me... Invoking Python Python Yeah, I think they disabled that. Um, Once you install, I think we have to install Flake 8. We should have tested on Kali. Python.m dash Yeah. So I'm gonna increase the font for this. You should do this before you do that next step. Python dash M. Can you see that? This one. this one. So in order to have, because it's not installed on Kali, so you have to install Flake 8. So Python dash M pip install Flake 8. Oh, it's going to be in the beginning. 
Yeah. 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 Ye
eight statistic and then uh, this is pseudo app install plug in yes I just did that what did it say defaulting user installation normal set packages is not writable requirement is satisfied flake is in here in the site packages it's already satisfied uh yeah, not able to get yeah. local lib Python three site packages break in. Let me move and see. I move this one. Wow. Were you able to run Flake Eight? You guys okay with that? Huh? Oh yeah. Yeah, mine for some reason it didn't want to run Flake A. Yeah, I'm I I see it right here because I installed it and it puts it here. So what I think you have to do is you have to. It says it existed. Permit already satisfied. Requirement already satisfying PyCode installation of normal site packages is not writable. Yeah, were you able to run it okay? Hmm? Yeah, run it okay. And you're using Kali? Yeah. Yeah, mine doesn't want to open Flake for some reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just Flake 8. Has now it's it does it so i i updated it and then it runs it now i knew it <laughs> all right so so it ran it right so it ran the installation so now i can run this 
Oh, I forgot. Mike, were you able to do it okay? And then uh, you just need to access the Yeah, so when you're getting results like this, what it's telling you is it, yeah, you have to fix the trailing white space. And then before and after the operator, the trailing white space. So you got to go back to the file. Make sure you're, I put down, make sure that there are white space after the commas, before and after the equal sign indentation is that, right? After the commas. Yeah, you have to do four space. Not tab. Tab is way more. That's why. Yeah. You gotta add the space before and after the comma. That, that nano file is going to be saved as quickly? No, save it as uh, test1.py. Oh, yeah. 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 It says white space before, white space before, trailing white space. Oh, then you have to reduce. <laughs> so when you see the error, I think I put too many space in there. Did you add it to the lab, uh, the PlayStation stuff? Or was it just on the website? I added to, yeah, so. It shows you on the, it shows you on the um, command line. Yeah, you can do Python and install safely. And then do an update if it doesn't want to install. Yeah, good. Okay. And then you use flake A. So on the next step, you would do. Do I just keep going back and forth until it detects no error? Mm -hmm. 
I forgot, was this not supposed to have space, right? That's what I thought. I thought I put, they're supposed to have space, but then it tracks it as there's space. So when I added space, it did not like that. Did you get the statistic? Yeah, it's it's gonna give you the result. And then it just gives nothing. Yeah, and then go to the next step. Yeah. So, if, so I when I put white space before, then it tells me white space after. So now I gotta do. I, I forgot. Yeah, it was the white space after, but not white space before. Yeah. So white. So you don't put the white space before, but you put the white space after. Two dash. I've got trailing white space for line two, three, and four. For statistics? Yeah, yeah you're going to wait. Oh. I, uh, I can pull it and then I did it again. Character for what? iPhone. Oh, sorry, I don't. I don't have an iPhone. At the makerspace, they have the the tablet charger, but. Are you switching to your application? No, I had to modify something, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, so wait, wait. Is it two dashes? Yeah, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does it have a lot of errors when you get it initially? Like, going back and forth between? Going back and forth between? Banana and uh, execute all the errors? Yeah. So, so it's all the errors you made? Yeah, that's right. I have, I have one error, and then it, and then that was it. So you took them out, popped them up, and took them out. Okay. So that one, right? Eh? Did you change something? Did you change something? Yeah, no, it worked. So it's supposed to look like this. Like, you know, yeah, but you re got to remove the space at the end of each line. And then after each comma, you have to have a space. Is that not an equal sign? Yeah, it is an equal sign. Space before and after equal sign. What? For flake A? Yeah. Uh, can you change the... Yeah. Let's see. 
What about if you try the next step? See if it's running verbose or or quiet. Yeah, quiet count, and then yeah, it's run the others to see if. If it's not giving you, it should give you statistics with an S. Yeah, I think so. I turned quiet. So I think something's weird with your break A. What I did was I actually went to the directory where break A is, mm -hmm. and then I made the, I copied the file there, and then I run it there. Because, oh, you're just giving me a too yeah, so what I did was, you know, it just says it can't find it, whatever. Mm -hmm. So it shows you the, the dot local, wherever. So I copy and paste that link, and then I just, you know, CD there, and then I just run it to it. But. I have four, and it took four years to do it. I don't think you have to do it. I don't understand. Is this thing too? Yeah, the file is just the word file? Oh, yeah. Uh, the end of file. Yeah, the, yeah. I think end of that line. Yeah. Or just ask the exact file and then here is this. Oh, I see what it meant. There's a line, there's a, a blank space line at the end after your last one. Goes all the way down. Wow, thank you. For We're thinking. over analyzing. Really? Well, it's going to be a whole different thing. Is it plus eight there? It's in Florida, but it's just going back to here. Uh, so it says sudo install flake. Yes, that's good. Yeah, it's just unable to, yeah, to do from the Python one. From the Python end, install flake thing. Uh, what is it again? Python dash. Yeah. So, I think it's a, uh, okay. It's just a quick step because, um, it's in the site packages. So, 
I actually went inside the site packages because it keeps giving me. Yeah, so it tells me that I, I was in a local lib Python site packages, right? And so I just, you know. I'll show you this step because there was a bunch of error at the beginning. Yeah, I got this right. Uh, like eight is not found. You're and in that directory, though. How did you get into that? Yeah, directory? so I just copy and paste that directory because it gives me a. You typed it in right there. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Are you guys able to run play? No, it just produced less output in text. It's not as robust. You, when you ran the statistics, was it a lot? Yeah, so you don't want a lot of that. Like, it might not be useful. So you want it quiet to make it less. Basically, you filter out unnecessary things. Yeah, so after I install, I went into the site packages because it actually told me it cannot locate the package to run it. Yeah, when I put the, put that in, it didn't go through. I have to find where it got installed into it. Yeah, it should say, you know, it's already there. It's at certain location. I forgot how good gummy bears are or gummy fruits. <laughs> yeah, and then I, I did LS because it should come down with DLint. And when DLint get installed, it should put like eight there because it uses that to run DLint. And then, are we okay? Any questions? Yeah, I did LS and I saw DLint there and Flake 8 there. So I just made my file there. And then um, I installed yeah. it again when it, it tells me it can't find it, whatever. And then I ran and then I removed all the error. And now I'm going to do like a statistic, right? Which is the next step. It says it's already satisfied, it's just not um, found. I, I think it's in a different direction. Okay, so I think you're in, um, you should go to this. 
Or what do do pseudo atoms solve flakes? And then you couldn't do the Python M. The Python M pip and install flake A. Try it again. No. It will show you where it puts it. wildcard so it plugs in whatever python file you have in that directory so normally you want to be in the directory where you have all your programs like your python program and then you scan it based on so um so the difference between statistic and quiet right quiet's going to give you less in the output less verbose statistics is going to give you a lot you can also like do something with that data. We can make it where it puts it into a CSV file and then clean it up. We can also do a count. And so this is gonna give you the error that's listed in the last one, um, if you had error. So in order to run Flake successfully, you gotta fix all the error in your program. And then, um, you know, and then when you do file name and then anything with the wildcard is gonna be anything with the Python uh, extension. And then here you're able to get information for the bug report by doing bug report this way. When she got into the directory? Mm -hmm. I do an LS to see if like it's there. Yeah. Is it there? Mm -hmm. Okay, then you run the, the, you put the nano file there. Okay, so copy whatever that was in the in your home directory to that location or just remake it. What I did was I just redo the file and fix all the error and then, you know, or you can do a copy command. Okay. Then on the second part, if we did the second part, it's similar. So you're going to do a pylint. So I'm just gonna install it here, I guess. So if you just gotta see where your Flick 8 is located, if it throws it into the site packages, you need to navigate there because sometimes it doesn't install if your Python doesn't install correctly. So uh, let's see, uh, was it pip install? And then I will go ahead and do pilot of the same file that I created, test1.py. Mm -hmm. 
So now it's going to want to install. Yeah, it doesn't work well with pip3, I notice, or pip. So now we're going to do a pilot. And pilot is, um, oh, it's telling me, oh, yeah, missing module doc string. Yeah, because you remember I tell it to import pickle and I didn't have pickle there, right? So it's telling me that there is a module that's missing to work with that Python file. So that's correct. And it is seven, it gave me a score. It's 7.5 out of 10. Yeah. Oh. I didn't do the other part, but are, are you still waiting? Sometime this part is long. Well, I, I just want to make sure if it's slate gauge file name and not set to one. Hmm? Yeah, fake eight file name. So basically you're saying run flag eight on file name with anything with a dot pi. Test one. You don't plug test one oh, in. Sorry. Yeah, just use file name. So this switch allows you to say run flake eight on any file name that has a Python extension. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because there are other Python test files in the site packages or other area, then you will get it, right? Or in the past, if you download and install other Python scripts from the other program, it's going to scan against that too. Okay. But you can use the wildcard to your best advantage where you can basically run a group of, of, of files that are Python. And it will tell you, oh, is this not secure? So as we go, we want to take a screenshot and answer the question. Now for pilot, you're gonna see that it also checks against your code and it's gonna look at errors. It's also gonna give you ranking or score and it uses the pie checker so it also used flake eight, pi flake, and my pi. These are the type of tools that it's integrated with the pylon. Okay. So if you want it less robust, you can actually use the option to kind of decrease the output. And then you can also change the configuration file of the application. So when you do it, you're gonna get a score. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add some lines to it. Uh, I'm gonna add this to the top, to the test file. And then I'm going to add the pilot option. So I'm going to disable it for the line that's too long. So what you're doing is you're building the code or, or the, the pilot stuff into the program itself. Hmm? 
Oh, we love a live session. There's also another call for us, right? Maybe we can provide a kind of. Maybe we can just get the sound. So, afterwards, can you see this? We can. I kind of want to make sure. Okay, so once we edit the 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 test file, we save it, and then we are going to run it. Um, in this one, we're running the Python using the Python three command. So we're we're gonna run it as a Python file because we already added the delete code to it, so we don't need to run it as a D, a, a Python. I'm sorry. Um, So we're going to do a Python 3 test pilot.py. Oh, can you just say, oh, I cannot open. Let me try just Python. Oh, I saved it as a test one, so I'm going to save it as a new name. Yeah, so here, this one, um, make sure that it's just the file name that you use. Sorry about that. If you if you save it as a, here I had you save it as a test one, right? And so you gotta run it as a test one. And then we're going to make a new file called test2. And in this one, this script is really uh, an automated script to ping. I'm pinging my own server. So this is a way that we can write a ping function. This is the IP address of the server. We're going to use it to issue the command ping count one for the server. So this is going to be like the command for so it's gonna plug the IP address in here. It's gonna count one, so one ping. And then it's gonna return the output for the process. And then it's gonna print out, it's gonna display the text that it, it pings this, right? And then what we're gonna do is we are going to add in the pilot. So what I'm doing with this is I can have a script and then I can also use my pilot to be able to, um, assess that script. So once you have that, then you can so we can do nano test two dot py. Make sure we have the py for the Python. Right? And then I wanted to check now, technically, you should indent here. So I'm going to fix all the syntax I know that's wrong. So extra space there. There should be an indent here. This It's a function definition. So one, two, three, four. Let me see what this does. Because I think when you look at the code, it doesn't have any indentation. And then uh, we're going to define the command arguments as a list. And then we are to do a return. So this should be. So one, two, three, four. Mm. 
And then we're gonna do a print pilot. Let me see if it likes this. That was a test two. Oh yeah, I didn't like my symbol because I copy and paste. So let me nano back. <laughs> I was too lazy to type. So it did not like my quotation mark on this. And then on this. And then on the P. How are you doing? You okay. Okay, good. Yeah, because that was the issue was it could not find where it kept it right. Mm -hmm. It's weird because on mine it puts it on a different location. Yeah, I think it's because it's different releases of Python that it um, that certain Kali version is released. They have maybe some issues, but. All right, so we should be okay. I gotta make sure I fix all the symbol, especially the quotation mark because Microsoft Word used different encoding. All right, so control X, yes. And then we're going to run it as a, oh. Why does it say that? Invalid character. This one, I got to fix this one. There it is. It's a string. Return self process open to me. Uh, return outside of the function. Okay. Yeah, I forgot to indent. One, two, three, four. Okay, so we're good. Fix all the syntax error. So it shows me that it did the ping, right? So we did a ping program for the test two. And then this is the rate for the ping. Uh, So the ping program work, it says the name lint is not defined, pilot. What did I? Import pilot. Standard error. Maybe this is pilot, but they updated this now. But let me see. Yeah, no attribute. Pi module pilot has no attribute. Pi run. Pilot pi underscore run. So I don't think. Some stuff changes, right? Let's see. This is, should just be lint.py last time. Let me save this and let me look at the module. OS. Uh, OS. Oh. Yeah, it has the lint module. Expand module message handler parallel.py. So control 
Going to run again. Flint, I run module name return true. Lint is not defined. Yeah, it pings okay. But it didn't like my, um, it, it didn't output the standard error for Oh, I get it. This the module name that py. So this part right here, you guys can modify this to one of the module that you have in <laughs> that install, like your dlint or another, like the you know, test one that py. So let's try that. Give me one second. The module name, this part right here. We gotta, we can put like, so what we can do is we can use pilot and then we will have it check, right? Or you can, let's try to put test two and see what it does. do test two. We have it check itself. So this is a ping program, right? It's an automated ping program. It pings, I ping myself. And then you can add one line when you import in Pilot. This allows you to uh, run the Python file and then check it at the same time. So let's see if that works. Yeah, it did not like my lint. I think I'm gonna. It didn't. It couldn't access this for some weird reason. Which is strange. I gotta take a look at like why. Where is it? Thailand is already at the newest version. No, it's, yeah, it's here. So if you're getting an error for the pilot stuff, but it ran the ping, that's fine. It says you will likely receive an end of F error, which is a pilot standard error. Since this file is short, it will not fully assess the script. So that's just a screenshot that. Yeah, it, it also count like the number of lines in. So you, you might get an end of file error. But I, what I'm getting is I'm actually getting 
a lint um, issue. Yeah, I'm getting, so I modified the, the module name. I put test2.py there. And then I, um, maybe if I fix the symbol, I think that might be the problem. I don't think it's a problem. Yeah, you gotta tell it what, so what you're doing in with the last line for test two is you, you're saying, run this file and assess the code for it. Run the code and assess the code at the same time. So, so it's, it it's supposed to be, but right, you gotta fix. Well, 30 minutes we still have. Control X, yes. It's only two exercises. Well, the last it's fine. I got to find why it's not seeing this. But yeah, if you see, this is your ping rate right here. And uh, you might get an error because it says for mine, it says trace back. It's not able to open the standard error pilot. Possibly that when they modify the newest version of pilot might have updated some of their function or whatever it is. So it's not able to return any kind of error. Um, but it's supposed to give you some error, like your end of file is to, you know, when I ran this, like maybe not even a year ago, six months ago, that's what it says. So take a screenshot and then answer the questions. But the module name part, you should put in test two here. Right, whatever your Python file that you, you want to use. So you just simply add a line. That was the idea is to use PyLint to be able to have you um, assess the code itself automatically. Can you go back to the test to that you want? So the, the, um, the actual file itself. Uh, okay. Yeah, it's not seeing lint pi run. So I have an error theory for the lint file, but it's not using the lint pi For your server? Yeah. Make sure you fix this. Change the retype the quotation mark. The strings are always going to be in green and nano. If you choose, if you save it as a Python. Mm -hmm. And I, I noticed that I was maybe if I'm on the screen, but you don't have the turn through at the end of the test tool that you want to do your loop on. Yeah, it's throwing an error right here for this function. It says that it cannot find this function, but I think it has to do with the way that I had it installed. It puts it in a Python package and it's not running the Python package with the module. It's happening a lot with Kali lately. So I think there's a fix for it. One of my students sent me a link I haven't had time to look at. Okay, so which files need to be in? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when you ran the earlier, the dlint. Um, 
first of all, oh, okay. the answer is that I saw the test two of the one that was going to be out of the ball. I got the ping. Yeah, and then I'm I'm um the issue is it's yeah, yeah the lint pie run. I gotta read their documentation and see what happened with this because sometime if they modify this. But I really think yeah, because it says this is the Python file that it assessed. And it's not able to execute this. So pretty much the Python three was bringing vulnerability to support. No, Python three is the Python package. Basically, you need it to run the the dot py file. But, but I added, I imported pylint. So the error is that it's not able to access lint, which is in pylint. Um, it's a subclass of pilot to to run this 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 function. It's not able to run this function. So I'm thinking that it's not seeing the object. Um, it's because the way that I had it installed, possibly, because here it's saying it's at the dot local Python site packages. This is the file that it uses. But I'm still able to successfully ping. So Python, it's interpreter. So it's going to, even the last part doesn't, there's an error. It's still going to run the one that works, right? It stops at the last line, which is my lint. Let me see if I can fix it. So it shows me that it pinged one time and it's received. So it works. Yeah, we're supposed to use pilot to assess this. Yeah, Lint is there. We have the run py here, maybe. Maybe instead of py underscore run, we just have a run. I'm gonna try that real quick. And I gotta backtrack out. Line nine. Name error. Name lint is not defined. Pilot. Has no attribute run. Next. Okay. 
Did your friend ever get his car fixed, Lee? Are you doing you okay back there? Yeah, I think the Simon Chase is like that function that works as a method. Yeah, so, you know, just like everything else, it's going to take time for us. You know what I mean? Also, this is too that you, you guys are new to this. So you, you know, after this one, you're going to be like, oh, this is where I fix this. And this is how I use the tool. So this pretty much is 36. Hmm? This is 36. Well, fundamentals are Oh, this is only one one lap out of 30 C. Well, one one part of the exercise in 30 C. Yeah, actually. This is like I think it was in unit 10 that I pulled. There was another piece to this that they did in nine. Um and then I think I use um W3AF and uh, other tools with them. But yeah, and then we did and map with API through Python and other things. But yeah, they're not gonna let me teach 30C for the fall because you know we have to offer the classes that gonna fill. So good. <laughs> 40D is gonna run for the network administration course. It's gonna be online with James Bo, hopefully to be able to teach it but i already had a conversation yesterday about if it's not gonna go um then we'll have a cancel conversation i guess but you know you guys sign up for the class if you need it because it's gonna be like once a year that we're gonna be able to find it who is it 40 40 d i think you asked me about that mm -hmm. last time yeah, he said that it looks like a lot of the students, not a lot of students, but the students who need, need to finish certificate, you know, so he's going to try to let it open. Mm -hmm. um, but he said that if it's like five or six, he might not keep it open. Mm -hmm. So I told him, I told him I'm going to try to tell all my other students that need to, to take it. Is it for fall? Yeah, for the fall. And That's, this is in that IT project management. Yeah, so I think it's... um. Uh, the summer, it's going to be like CIS 78 or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 78. Mm -hmm. um, the, the math 78 is going to be like foundation for data science is going to run in fall. So it's the first data science class outside of 38. 38 is 
Python is part of it too. Yeah. But yeah, I think Daryl, yeah, Daryl Brown is teach, teaching and he's pretty cool. He's easy going. He teaches 1A sometimes. So I'm gonna, so that certificate, with that certificate, there's some overlapping. So the IT project management, the way I, I wrote it is, you have to take uh, 1A, 27, because I really feel like IT project manager needs to know security. There's a cloud plus class, it's introduction to cloud. Um, and so if we fill the, the, the intro to project, IT project management, because there's two parts to it. There's the A and then there's the B. And then, you know, um, and then the cloud. So I think there's only like five or six classes or something like that. It's a small certificate. Mm -hmm. So you will be able to fulfill at least two classes coming from the cybersecurity side. And then I got to finish the cloud administration certificate too, where there are like four cloud classes. I just need to do two more classes. Program, you offer I'm I'm gonna see. I think I wanted to try to offer it online, and even with that, like, I don't know. Oh. I yeah, like it has to fill because I you know I did the online via Zoom. I think that's why it didn't fill. But I think I have the recording now, so I I might just do it straight online where you just watch the video. Oh. Um. The challenge with this is, you know, like when I taught the class, everything works. And then, you know, six months later, they changed the package. So now I have to find out like why open source is always like that constantly. This is why a lot of people don't like teaching Python because it changes a lot, right? But it's okay. Yeah, so hopefully we'll be able to offer it um, later. But not really like any yeah yeah 30 a is is gonna run i'm teaching 30 a online in the summer um and then maybe down the line we'll do 30 c and d together 30 a is intro right 30 a is intro yeah python's piece of cake easy much easier than c plus plus Some of my students, they don't like it though. They're like, I like C++. C++ has a lot. Yeah. Bye. Oh, wait, no, next week, no. Yeah, spring break, no school. Don't forget. Bye, guys. Bye. Okay, so have a good break. Please stop recording.